Having done an overview now of the land, looking at the different places and kind of traveled through it, looking at a series Evidence for Bible Truth, we really want to get into the Bible study part of this now. We're not going to be doing a workbook per se, as we uh, have done other youth conferences that we may have attended. Rather, we're going to be trying to get the information right into our Bibles. It's very important that we take this information with us, because when we're places where we can talk about God's truth, we want to be able to have a ready reference for what we've learned and what we've studied. So our plan is going to be to try and Bible mark things right into the Bible itself. So just a couple of tips when it comes to Bible marking. Um, first of all is we're not trying to create works of art. Um, sometimes you can think of a, a Bible marking as you think of the monks who would sit there and with their calligraphy they would, they would spend hours and hours and hours working on an absolutely perfect work of art. That's not our intention. What we're intending to do is to try and create something that is useful to us. It's a tool to help us in our understanding of the Bible and to recall what we learn as we travel through the land. So what we're going to focus on is a series of Bible places. And Brother Lane Rittmeyer really is the one who I would say in many ways pioneered this way of looking at the, uh, the Bible. And um, we've put online actually many of his studies, there's I think six of them, um, from the Ontario Winter Bible School, the classes themselves, the audio portions. But we'd like to kind of go through a little bit of the methodology on the Bible study and how we can do the same thing. We're going to look at several places as we go through our tour. We're going to look at Shechem, Hebron, Jerusalem, and others that we'll, we'll make a list for you of ones that we'd like to actually do the study on. We'd like to collaborate that study, each of us work on it, and then when we get to the land, we'll share what we've learned together. One of the things we want to do, though, is make sure that that does end up in our Bible. So, Bible marking is critical. Um, there's several ways to go about it. One of which is to actually write it right into the margins of the Bible. And the other is to use a sheet um, that we will stick into the Bible that you could specifically use for, for one place. When we do an in-depth study, sometimes this is a better way of going about it, because you might run out of room in your margin. Um, so sometimes if you have that extra piece of paper in there that has the lines in it and you can write it all down, then that is sometimes very helpful. A couple of tools we provided for you on the website is an interlinear sheet that you can download. You can just print out. Uh, one is intended to slide behind a page that you have in your Bible. So you, you take one of these Bible marking sheets and it looks somewhat like this and um, you just simply slide it behind your existing page and it works like a little grid so that you're not trying to write um, well your, your lines don't go up and down they go straight across so it, it economizes your space in your margins and just makes it helpful to write things a little bit more neater the second thing of course is to actually have an insert which looks very similar to the same thing the line sheet that you would glue right into the margin of the place that you deem the most fitting to, to sort of gear the study out of and that's uh, what you would use, is you would then just use that sheet and you would write the references on there. I would recommend that for this uh, study we're going to do, because we're going to have several passages we're going to look at, and it's very easy to very quickly cramp up your margin space in your Bible. And as the years go by, and you hold on to the same Bible, if you're like me, I've had this one since I was about 11 years old. Um, I'm not parting with it. I've, I've rebanded, I think, seven times. So you become very, very close to your Bible until it begins to eventually disintegrate. But if you want to economize on that space, then by all means, just stick a little piece of paper into the margin. Critical thing to remember, though, is when you're gluing into your Bible, is use an acid-free glue. You can pick these up in an art store, um, a restoration store, some of the crafting stores. The reason acid free is important is because some glues have the acid in them that will actually eat the pages of your Bible. It's also important to use the right Pigma ink. Um, we recommend using a, a specific pen called a Micron. Um, and there's different versions of this. There's or different brands that you can use. One's Micron, and then the other one is the um, Prismacolor, and there's other ones like that. They're fine liquid markers. Um, but again, they are archival inks that they're using, and so they won't go through the page when you're writing. If you use a regular ballpoint pen, it will bleed through the page over time, it will smear out. And um, I have some that I, I used when I was quite young, and um, they are somewhat quite comical because they, they bleed right through the page and you actually in the end can't read anything. So a um, couple of other points that, that are helpful is just in the color scheme, again, Remember, we're not trying to make words of art here. This is, this is more about trying to make it functional. One of the tips that uh, I think it was Brother Roger Lewis mentioned this years ago is using like a color like 
brown for all the Strong's numbers um, because that tells you that those aren't your comments or somebody else's comments. They are actual facts. Um, so if you put the Strong's numbers in brown, A, it's always easy to find them, and B, um, when you're looking through your notes, you can tell what are references, because um, I usually do those in black, it just makes it a little bit easier, um, and what are, what are Strong's numbers, so you can discern very quickly when you're looking in the margin of your Bible. So that's just a couple of tips on Bible marking. Um, the other thing is to use a, a springboard passage. So whatever study you're doing, as you go through and you, you look up the different passages, um, it's helpful to, to pick one place where you sort of, it, it's a verse that means something to you that you'll remember easily, and use that as the passage where you're going to gear everything out of. So if you pick, for instance, Hebron and we decide Genesis 3.18, it's the first mention of the word, um, and that's where we're going to key from, you would stick your insert page into that spot and use it as the, the sort of springboard passage for what you're going to look at. And then all other references in the Bible go back to that place. So when you get to another place in the Bible where the word Hebron comes up, you might write the meaning in the margin, so you've got it if you're doing the readings later on in Deuteronomy or Joshua. Um, but the main source of information is back in Genesis 13 verse 18. And you just simply put a little note in your margin, uh, study on Hebron, see Genesis chapter 3 verse 18, and that takes you back then to that springboard passage, and then you can write all the passages in just the one place, and again, economize on space. Um, when I originally started doing some of this, I would try and write every single passage in every single uh, place in my margin, and that became rather cumbersome, because then you had great big swaths of text, and the time it takes just to write it all out, and it becomes fairly repetitive. So pick a springboard passage and use that as the place to, to gear from. And the other thing, um, years ago, I think Brother Stephen Palmer was the one that mentioned this as a, as a sort of a method of doing this, is that if you're doing a talk um, and you have a specific, specific theme that you're following, you can put the, 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 the note about the verse that you want to talk about, and what he would do, he, was, he would write the passage that he was coming from and the passage that he was going to. So using his margin, he could actually just follow through in the Bible, this is where I came from, this is the next passage where I'm going to. So if you're somebody who likes to be able to, you know, do a talk fairly well, not off the cuff, but right out of your margin, that's a good method of doing it as well. So we're going to take our, uh, our study from Hebron, and uh, we just want to talk about a couple of Bible study tools that will also be helpful as we go through this. We're going to use Hebron as, as the place for studying Bible places, or as the key passage. There's lots of other ones we could look at, but it just kind of forms a good, a good example of one that we can use. Um, but as we go through the different studies of the different places, we're going to use the same methodology. And the idea is to look at it, what, where was the place? Get a geographical understanding of where it is, and for that you're going to use an atlas. Um, then you're also going to find out, well, what exactly um, does the name of the place mean? That's also fairly important, specifically in Bible terms, because places have significance in their names written right into them. And thirdly, what happened in that place? But we're going to look at what happened in the place, both in the Old Testament, in the time of Abraham, Joshua, Moses perhaps, right the way through the kings, into the time of the prophets, and then into the New Testament, and when the Lord Jesus Christ or John the Baptist may have been around there, just to help us kind of get a full scope of what this place was all about. That is specifically helpful when it comes to looking at the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his life, because he goes to different places and it says that he must needs go through, let's say, Samaria. So there was a reason why he had to be there. And quite often the reason for that is found in the prophets and in the Old Testament because the Lord is either fulfilling a prophecy or what happened in the Old Testament is specifically important for us to understand what is taking place. So a couple of Bible tools to, um, to key on when we're going through this. Obviously the first of which is a concordance. Now we would highly recommend um, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. This is a, um, a softback cover and um, these are actually out of print but you can still get them at secondhand bookstores. I would highly recommend this. Um, I scoured for my Sunday school class years ago to make sure every one of the kids in the class had one of these 
these uh, strong exhaust of concordances. So this isn't the strongest strongs or the new strongs, it's the original strong exhaust of concordance. Um, we recommend the, the King James Bible simply because the text is probably the most accurate and some may argue that, but it's a good springboard to, to work from. Strong's works very simply. Um, it's a dictionary of, of or a lexicon. You can look through it and you can find in there the place, for instance, we're going to look up Hebron in our study together. And once you find the place, it lists for you all the words um, where, or the times that Hebron is used in the Bible, the word itself. And then it tells you um, what the Strong's number is for that word, so you can look up then the meaning in either the Greek or in the Hebrew. It gives you the rough uh, rundown of, well, not the rough rundown, but the, the where it's used in the Bible. So in this case, it's used for Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First Chronicles, uh, First and Second Chronicles, and and First Kings. It doesn't actually appear in the New Testament text, although it is there in the story as we're going to see when we look later on. So next to it then is the is the Strong's number. In this case it's 2275. Now when you get to the back of the concordance it has two lexicons in there. One is the Greek lexicon which is for New Testament words and the other is the Hebrew lexicon which is for Old Testament words. So when you're looking you want to make sure you got the right lexicon it tells you right at the top but quite often, as you, if you're like me, you end up looking a word up and it's early in the morning or late at night and you can't understand why um, the meaning isn't making any sense and then you realize that you're supposed to be in the Hebrew and you're, you're trying to look it up in the Greek. So Strong's number is 2275 and 2275, as we look that up, again, it's all referenced by number. So you then find it in the, the concordance, um, in the dictionary part of it, the lexicon, and tells you 2275. It is the word Hevron, which is the pronunciation on it, of it. It tells you it's from a root word from 2267, and it means the seat of association. And it's a place in Palestine or Israel, and it's the name of two Israelites. So that's the, the short meaning of this. So you can then look back at, well, what is 2267? And it's Heber, um, which basically is the idea of a society. So when you think of Hebron, we think of the society. Um, and we think, of course, of the society of God and of Abraham and of his family. And, of course, in the New Testament, we think of the commonwealth of Israel. So it's the idea of a society. Well, that's Strong's Concord. So it, it gives you, this is where it is, uh, this is what it means in the back of the concordance, and here's all the uses of that word. But if you wanted a bit more of a detailed description, that's when you would pull out a different concordance, and um, there are two sort of concordances or, or dictionaries or lexicons that go a, a, along with this. One is Gesenius, and Gesenius is a Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, and the other one is Thayer's. So these are like, that's the, the, the short answer in the Strong's concordance. This is more the paragraph answer in either Thayer's or in uh, Gesenius. So in our case, we're looking at an Old Testament word, so we're going to use um, Gesenius, and again, it's key to the Strong's numbers, and this is where using a King James with the Strong's concordance, Gesenius and Thayer's work along um, quite nicely with it. So we look up there, number 2275, and again, on the outside of the margin are all the uh, all the different numbers are there, so you can easily find it. Not every word will appear in one of these concordances, because um, there isn't a, a more detailed definition. But this one certainly does. Um, so 2275. So again, it gives you the, the Hebrew word itself. And it also tells you that it means conjunction or adjoining together. Um, and it tells you it's an ancient town in the tribe of Judah, so a little bit more specifically than just a city in Palestine or in Israel, um, formerly uh, called a different name, um, which is Hebrew, which unfortunately I can't read. And it gives you a couple of passages, Genesis 13, verse 18, 23, 2, and it says compare Judges 1, verse 10, and we'll go through and look at these. But it tells us as well that it was a royal city of David for some time, um, until the taking of Jerusalem. So, of course, we'll look at that in our study of it as well. And um, it tells you it's the city of the friend of the merciful God, i.e. the man Abraham. And it's also the name of several different people. So, 
that is, is a much more detailed definition, so that's very helpful as well. So having gone through our Bibles and having figured out what these places are and what they mean and having written those meanings down, the Strong's number and the number from Thayer's or the, the de definition from Thayer's or Gesenius or Vines or whatever lexicon or dictionary that you've used, we then want to turn around and, and do the actual study of the word. How is this word used? Where is this place used in the Bible? And probably one of the first things you want to do is get an, an atlas and have a look at exactly where this place is. So there are three atlases that our brother Lane has recommended that we, we have a look at. Um, as we've mentioned before, the first is the, the Moody Bible Atlas, um, which is a great resource, um, very helpful, very descriptive. The second is the Zondervan Bible Atlas, and the third is the Carter uh, Bible Atlas. So any of these um, would suffice. Um, to kind of get a, a good idea of, of what this place is and, and where it's used. So, of course, with all atlases, again, it's similar to a concordance or a, a dictionary. You have at the back of the book um, sort of the, the index, I guess you could call it, and you go through the index and you find out where is Hebron found in this atlas. 
So we look up the word Hebron and we find out that in this specific one it comes up several times in the atlas and we can look those up and see okay how exactly is it. So ver page 29 is the, the first one and uh, we turn to page 29 and we find out on page 29 what exactly um, or where exactly Hebron is located. So this is a map of um, a very basic map going back to the dynasties of Israel uh, or of Egypt really and it gives us Hebron as being right below Jerusalem. So it just kind of gives us a little bit of an idea and understanding and again you can go through several of these and, and take a look at where it is. You can also use the atlas in the back of your Bible. Um, some of those atlases are a little outdated um, and sometimes it's helpful to look at a couple of them to find out exactly what the place is all about. So this is the, um, the uh, Zondervan Atlas of the Bible and we're just going to look it up in here as well and see if it sheds any more light on it. I mean the other one has a lot more in there than what I looked up but just to give you an idea so again Hebron and it appears a bunch of different times and uh, but it also gives you a little definition it says it's the hill or town in the hill country of Judah mentioned 64 times in the Old Testament there Abraham pitched his tent and built an altar Genesis 3:18. he purchased the cave of Machpelah where the patriarchs and their, and their wives are buried, Genesis 23 and verse 18, which we'll look up in a moment. The Israelite spies passed Hebron on their trip through the land of Canaan, Numbers 13, verse 21. Hebron was captured by Joshua, given to Caleb. Um, it was a Levitical city, Joshua 12, 21, verses 11 and 13. A city of refuge, Joshua 20, verse 7. David ruled from Hebron for seven and a half years before moving his capital to Jerusalem in 2 Samuel. Um, it was Hebron the later where Absalom began his revolt from, 2 Samuel 15. It was fortified by Rehoboam, 2 Chronicles 11 verse 10. And uh, the earlier name was Kiriat Arba, uh, told us in Genesis 32 verse 2. And um, then it gives you all the different maps where Hebron um, comes up in this atlas. So this is actually pretty good because it gives you a, a kind of a rundown of what the place is all about. And we're going to follow through some of those passages. They're also given to us in the concordance. Um, but this kind of gives you a good good rundown. So the first map it gives you is on page 22. And um, so where are we here? Page 16, page 22. And uh, it gives you an idea on this map. It's quite helpful because it is uh, a map that kind of shows the topography of the land a little bit and we see that Hebron um, is just south of the city of Jerusalem um, and over towards um, the hill country as it says of Judah so it's it's on that that section of the mountains really of Israel so helpful when we, we figure out where this is where exactly it sits and kind of gives us a bit of a geographical idea so Always when you're looking at a Bible place, having a, a view of where it is, is very, very important. So let's begin then looking at where these passages come up in the Bible. So the first one we have in the concordance is Genesis chapter 13, verse 18, which the Atlas also mentioned. And uh, what I usually like to do is go through and, and write these, these passages down or, or type them out if you're more of a computer user, which I suppose I am. And um, when you go through and you look at them, you find that there is significance laid in all of them. So we've actually chosen to stick our, our um, sheet into the section for Genesis chapter 3 and verse 18, or 13 verse 18, because it is the first place where this passage comes up. Now again, when you're, when you're sticking your, your page in, um, I haven't glued this in yet, what you want to do usually is have it on the side where the, the name comes up. So if the name comes up on the right hand side, and that's where your lines are. You want to put it into the the uh, the page so that it sits on the left, and you look across to the right, and that's where Hebron, of course, comes up. So this is Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18. And what we read here is that Abraham is told, just for a little bit of context, it's in verse 14. The Lord said unto Abraham, after the lot was separated from him, lift up thine nine eyes and look from the place where there are northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the seed of the, uh, the dust of the earth, so shall thy seed be numbered. 
Arise, walk through the land, in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So that's the context of the, the passage, which is really important to get context. And quite often when we're doing Bible study, especially if we use a computer, um, what can happen is we just look it up in the computer, we see that one little verse, and we don't read the context. Take the time to open your Bible up and to go to the passage and read the context before and afterwards. It's always good to kind of get the picture of what was going on. So in Genesis chapter 13, then in verse 18, which is the passage identified by the concordance, it says, Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is Hebron, and built an altar there unto the Lord, or unto Yahweh. So this is the first place where Abram built an altar, and of course this is, or one of the first places, um, but it's also, the meaning of the name is the word association or fellowship or joining together. So this is after Lot has separated himself from Abraham, Abraham is joining himself to God. So it is just something to keep in our minds that that is what this, this place is all about. But also, of course, you have the word Mamre here. So you say, well, what exactly does that mean? And um, again, it says the plain of Mamre. And um, what does that mean? Well, we're going to look it up in the concordance as well because we want to know what that is. So again, we take our strong concordance and we turn the way through, look up the word Mamre, and then we'll get the Strong's number and we'll see what is the, uh, the meaning of this word. So again, as long as you know your alphabet, you should be able to figure this out, which for me sometimes can be a challenge. So just looking at memory, here it is, it comes at the bottom of the page, and it's the Strong's number 4471. So again, I might make a note of that, but I look it up first of all just to kind of figure out um, is it worth writing it down? Is the meaning something that, that makes sense to me? So what it tells you here, 4471, memory, it's from 4754, and the only definition it gives me here is the sense of vigor, or lusty is what the word used to mean, uh, well, Hebron used to be called that, and so you say, okay, let's take a look at seven or four seven five four. So that's over a few words. Four seven five four. Um, so four seven five four is the word uh, to rebel. Um, the idea of maltreating, to whip, um, to be filthy, or to lift oneself up. So that was 4755 was Mara. So it's the, the one before, 4754. So it's the idea of rebellion. So interesting that a place that used to be called rebellion now has its name changed to the word fellowship um, or to join together. So you have Lot who has left. He has, in a sense, rebelled, I suppose you could say. And Abraham is now in this city that is called fellowship. So that is probably something that's worth writing into the, the margin there. Um, so what I would usually do is write in the actual Strong's number. So I have that for uh, a reference point, which in this case is 4471. Then look up the definition in Strong's itself, um, which in this case, as we looked at, 4471 is... Um, given to us as lusty is what Strong's has to say and if we look at it in Gesenius 4471 gives us a little bit more detail on that again Gesenius is usually the longer um, word and it is as well it's the word strength and it is also tied in with the word fatness. And again, it is the name of an oak. 
right? So this is the, the place of strength, um, the place of fatness, and the name of an oak near Hebron. So it's Mamre, um, who basically uh, was an Amorite in the area and um, a friend of Abraham in league with Abraham. So it's the idea of uh, the Oaks of Mamre is what is laid out for us in the Bible as well. So that's just some of the, the meanings that come to us from, from the use of this word. So very helpful for us as we kind of lay these things out. So again, getting that definition right down into the margin of the Bible is, is very helpful. The next place we run into Abraham and Mamre or Hebron is in Genesis chapter 18. That's what Strong's Concordance tells us. So in Genesis chapter 18 verse 1, it's the place of Isaac's birth. So we find here that Yahweh appeared to him in the plain of Mamre, and he sat in the tent in the door in the heat of the day. So this just gives us a little bit of background to what is going on. Abraham is living in this place in Mamre, and he's in the tent, and he's in the door. And just over the page in verse 10, we find there that God comes to him or sends the angel. And um, they say to him in verse 9, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife will have a son. And Sarah heard it from the door of the tent, uh, which was behind him. So here we have Abraham, who is, we're told is well stricken in years. And um, Sarah is also old. And uh, they are to have a child. So this is what happened in Hebron which is also, of course, called Mamre. And if you come down to verse 16, it says there, The men arose from thence, and they looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. And Yahweh said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? And I know him that he will command his children, and they will keep the way of Yahweh, and do justice and judgment that Yahweh may bring upon Abraham all that which he had spoken um, of him. And so here we have them on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're, they're beginning that journey, and this is the place where Abraham is with the angels, and they recognize him, and they say, look, Abraham is a teacher, right? He's a man who is a teacher, and he's going to teach his children. And he's in the area of Mamre, and he's at the Oak of Mamre, and of course, it's a place of teaching. So, when we look at that, um, it's quite interesting, because quite often it would be around an Oak that teaching took place. But, just to give us the context here, so this is what's going on in Hebron. It's where the promise of Abraham is. It's where the angels are dispatched from. They go to Sodom to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, come over to the next passage that Strong's tells us about, and that is in Genesis chapter 23. So, Genesis chapter 23, and at verses 17 and 18, we find there that we have, again, a reference that's made. Because it's here that Abraham's wife Sarah dies, and so he decides that he needs a place to bury her, and he picks this very same place. So, Genesis chapter 23... And uh, we're coming in at verse 17, and um, we're told there that it's the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before um, Mamre. So it's the name Machpelah, and it is reinterpreted, uh, or renamed at this point in time, and before it was called Mamre. And it's the field, and the cave that was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, and wherein all the borders round about were made sure unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before um, all that went into the gate of the city. So it happens in the gate of the city, of course. Lots of transactions would happen in a gate of, of a city. This is where business was conducted, and this is where the deal is made for Abraham to purchase this field. So in verse 19, after this, Abraham buried Sarah his wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made assure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. So again, we have critical information that's given to us here. So we have him first of all. Uh, this is where the promise of the son Abraham, or, sorry, of Isaac is made. 
And now we have that it's the place where Abraham is to bury his wife, Sarah. Now, the other interesting thing is that it's Machpelah. So if we were to look at Machpelah again in, in Strong's Concordance, what we find out is Machpelah is the Strong's number 4375. And we turn to the back, to the, to the Hebrew Concordance, and we say, well, what, what exactly does that mean? So we come to Machpelah, 4375, and um, we have there the word Machpelah that's given to us. And we're told there that it is uh, Machpelah from 4717, a fold, um, a place in Palestine. So not overly helpful. Um, doesn't really tell us a whole lot. So we, we look back at 3717 and just say, well, what is, exactly does that mean? So 3717, um, does that help us out at all? And the answer, of course, is that it just simply means to repeat or double. So that's interesting. Machpila is a cave um, that is doubled. And so you say, okay, that's, that's somewhat maybe helpful. So let's take a look at what we find in the, um, in the uh, Gesenius' concordance. So we come over to 4375 again. Uh, same Strong's numbers that are tied together, which is what, why it makes this so helpful. Um, but 4375, and uh, Gesenius has the following to say, as soon as we get to 4375. So here we are, 4375. It's a doubling, or a portion, or a part, or a lot, Machpelah, proper name, um, of a field near Hebron where Sarah was buried. So again, it's this idea of doubling, or a portion, and uh, Brother Lane points out, and, and it's quite clear, that it really means the idea of a double cave. So, when archaeologists have looked at this cave of Machpelah, it really is the double cave. And uh, the Bible Magazine has a terrific article on that, um, which is well worth uh, having a look at, where it talks about the double cave of Machpelah. And there's some great photographs of that double cave there as well. So again, it's worthwhile then to take this information and to mark that into our Bibles. So in the case of um, this uh, little section here, um, it's probably good to go back to where we were in Genesis um, chapter 13 and verse 18. And again, um, taking your Bible marking pencil to mark in uh, the little section to do with Machpelah. Um, so what I usually do again is we'll take the, the black pencil and we'll, or pen and we'll write out Machpelah, the words, and then following that we'll write out the definition in the brown pen. And again, with the definition, we start out with the Strong's number, 4375, what it means is a double portion. And one of the other concordances that is helpful is uh, the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament. I don't actually have this in printed form. I only have it in the, uh, in the Libronics library on the computer. But if we utilize that, then um, it also tells us that it, it means as well a double cave. So that is very helpful in our understanding of this. Brown Driver Briggs tells us it means a, a double portion, and Gesenius um, means the idea of doubling. So in Genesis chapter 18, I would take the word Mamre, and um, in this case here, I usually just put a little mark in the margin, like a number one, if I don't have anything else there, and um, mark in my margin then number one, and I would take the definition of Mamre, which we looked up in the concordance, and um, I would put in there the name first of all, so I know once I fill this margin up, what is being spoken of. Um, and then I would turn around and say, okay, what does that mean? And so I would write down the Strong's number, which in this case here is 4471. 4471. And um, it means strength. But also, it has the idea of um, fatness. And um, we have the uh, other phrase here, which is plain, 
which we didn't look up but is worth looking up as well and I'm just going to put a little G there because plane is the next word we just want to define because it does help us in our understanding of this and that's the strong number 436 and it is the um, Hebrew word alone E-L-O-W-N or Elon which basically is the idea of a tree or a, uh, a great tree is the the oak of Mamre is is what Gesenius translates this so I'm just gonna write a little Gesenius the oak of Mamre which of course um, makes it a lot easier for us so that's the the idea that we get is the oak of Mamre so it's the plain of Mamre in the King James Version but it's actually the oak of Mamre and so next to Genesis chapter 18 and at verse 1 I'm gonna just put a little reference there C C slash P which is my little code word for to compare and it's gonna be Genesis 13 verse 18 and we just put the word Hebron because that's what we're dealing with in the uh, in the actual passage. So Genesis 13 verse 18 is Hebron. So you're cross-referencing this back to um, Hebron. So we want to make sure that we mark this into our springboard passage. So we're going to add this under the definitions, the beginning of the verses now that list off what happened at this place. So we begin, we write the heading there, the study of Hebron uses. And the first passage that we're going to write down is Genesis 18 verses 1 and 10. The promise of Isaac was given at Hebron. So this is the first event that we're aware of in the Bible. And we want to write this down here so we've got that as kind of the, the first passage. And it begins our list of what happens in this place. And then I would turn over to um, the next passage which we looked at, which was Genesis chapter 23 and verse 17. I put a little one by the word Machpelah and then in the margin as well and usually I would I would write out that that same word into the margin just so that once I fill this up I know what my one was referring to um, it might seem a bit redundant now but when you have a, a whole page full of uh, marking as time goes by you do find it helpful so Machpelah and uh, then I'm going to turn around next to Machpelah and I'm going to say, okay, what is this? And it's the Strong's number, 4375. And then again, put the definition in there, um, which is Strong's doubling. And then I might shorten it. I've got the long version in the other study. So I might just write down Gesenius tells us that it means a double cave. And then the second word, which I'd put a number two beside, is the word memory. And again, same thing, you want to put your Strong's number in there, 4471. And this time, of course, memory is uh, we're interpreting it as strength or fatness but it is also um, if we remember it's the oak of fatness or oak of strength so those are two passages is that we're going to send back to our springboard um, verse back in Genesis chapter um, 13 and verse 18 so back in the springboard passage of Genesis chapter 13, verse 18, we want to add this to our catalog, Genesis 23, verses 17 to 19. The cave of Machpelah in Mamre was purchased by Abraham for the burying of Sarah in Hebron. So this is, again, um, a critical part because it forms what we look at later on when we consider John the Baptist and um, the time of the Lord Jesus Christ and the significance of it to Caleb and other people who have to come in contact with it. So write that down in our springboard passage. So as we go through this study, 
of the uh, word Hebron and, and the place Hebron really, we're trying to build that catalog of what was this place all about? What are the key events that happened here throughout its history? So the passage we're looking at then is, is back in Genesis chapter 35 and at verse 27 is, is the next one in our list. And this is of course when um, Isaac is living in this area and um, it is the city um, Kiryat Arbor. So it just adds a little bit of a dimension to it. It's actually one of the names um, that is used currently in Israel, which is helpful as well. So Genesis chapter 35, we read there in verse 37, Jacob came to Isaac his father unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were a hundred and fourscore years, and of course this is where Isaac dies and is buried. So this is the place that Jacob returns after he's sojourned in the land um, with Laban the Syrian for all those years and he comes back to this place but it's got a different name here and it's called the city of Arba and it's the place where Isaac was dwelling. So Abraham lived there, Isaac would dwell there and now Jacob comes back to dwell in this very same place. So Arba then is worth looking up in our Strong's Concordance as well. This is where, I didn't do this the last time, but just tuck that little sheet behind um, into the margin um, and you lay down the lines and then when you put your page over, those little lines will just show through and uh, it just makes it a lot easier to see um, so when you're writing, your writing is a little neater. So again, we want to take this and we want to define what these places are. So we have first of all the city of Mamre, um, which we're going to add to our list. So we would put a little Y in the margin to match what's on the inside. And so we have Mamre. And of course, we have the definition there. So again, we write the word out of Mamre, which is helpful because Oak, again, was often a place of teaching. And then you have the second one here, which is also called the city of Arba. So I would just put a little one next to the word Arba. And then underneath um, my Y, and I've got my little lines there, make it easier. And again, write out the word Arba. And um, when you write that out, put the little dot beside it just to kind of break stuff up. And, and again, you know, you can do things a little differently if you like. Um, this is by no means a method that everybody has to adopt, but it's just what I find helpful. 7153. And of course, um, it is um, the word Kiryat, which is the, the first part, which is the word city. Um, so that's, that's the Z right there. So sometimes I'll just circle the Z as well. And I'll put the Z here. So this is Arba. It's really the, the city of Arba. So you have 7153, which is Kiryat, K-I-R. And the Hebrew, you don't pronounce um, the TH as a TH, it's just a T, which is city of, and then the second Strong's number is 704, so sometimes I'll put those in brackets. So you've got Kiryat, city of, and then Arba, which is literally Arba as well which of course means four or fourth um, so it's the city of, of the four basically is the idea that's given there so again we want to cross-reference this to our springboard verse which is C-P Hebron which is our study and that is in Genesis chapter 18 or 13 sorry in verse 18 and that's that's all we need to put there and that takes us back to Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18 now we want to capture the same passage on our note page back in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18 so you'll notice I, I forgot to leave a space for the one above but I would suggest just leaving a little space one line in between each note so it's just not as type on the page it helps to create a little bit of a border but now we want to write down Genesis 35, verse 27. Jacob returned from Syria to Hebron, where he is, uh, where Isaac dwelt, and um, 
it's also called Arba. So just a little note there so that when we're going back and we, we come back, we want to look at this, we're in a different passage. It just reminds us of the different points that we've learned along the way. So Jacob then is found living in the city of Arba, or Hebron, after his father dies. And it's from here that he dispatches Joseph. If you come over to Genesis chapter 37, which is next in the list of passages that we have for us, uh, Genesis chapter 37 and verses 13 to 15. We read there, his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem, so that's the destination they've gone to. And of course, Israel said to Joseph, Doth not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send thee unto them. And of course, Jacob's response is, Here am I. So he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Shechem, or sorry, of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So what that tells us is that Jacob is now dwelling in the vale, or the valley, of Shechem. And that as well is worth looking up and just marking those things down in our Bibles. So we're going to add the little number one next to the word veil, because it's interesting to know what exactly it means. It's Strong's number 010. It's emek in the Hebrew. It means a valley or a low land, an open country, a low-lying plain, a low area between two different elevations. And then, of course, we have the word Hebron, which we can write the definition in again and springboard it back to Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18. Now, you can pause the video as you go along and you mark these things in because we're just going to reference them from here on in, as I think by now you probably get the point on how this is going to work. From here then, we want to go back to our springboard reference and add in this passage into our springboard reference so that we have the same material there and it forms part of our catalog. This, of course, is Genesis chapter 37, and we are looking at verse 14. And we're going to write those things in that gives us the place that Jacob was living as well as, as his father Isaac, following in the footstep of his father Abraham. So we move on from here, and we come now to the time of Moses and of Joshua. So the next time we, we find this place is over in Numbers chapter 13. So let's turn over to Numbers chapter 13. This is when it, it shows up next in the record. And here we have a little bit of background given as to sort of what is going on as they come to the land. So Numbers 13, and it's verse 22. We find here verse 21 for a little bit of background. They went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob uh, as the men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came to Hebron. And what's going on in Hebron at this point in time? Well, of course, it's the time of Moses. The land has now been re-inhabited by the Canaanites. Um, so there's no Israelites dwelling there. The family of Abraham had moved down to Egypt. They're now coming back as uh, the, the tribe or the, the nation of Israel as it comes back into the land. And so what we find is they ascended from the south and they come to Hebron where Ahiman and Shishai and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. So this tells you that this is one of the cities of the giants. Now it tells you that Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. So it gives us a little bit of background to what this place is. And it says, They came unto the brook of Eshkol, and cut down from thence the branch of one of the cluster of grapes, and they bare it between two of them upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the frigs. And the place was called the brook of Eshkol, because of the cluster of grapes, and the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching the land after 40 days. So this is one of the places where the spies would go, and they go to this place, Eshkol. And of course, it means a cluster of grapes. It's the Strong's number 812. But it tells you that this was a fruitful place. Not only is it a place of giants, but it's also a place of great fruit. And it's the grapes or the dates of the land. The sweetness of the land is found in this place of, of Hebron. So when we think of the land flowing with milk and honey, the honey being the idea of sweetness, here is those dates or those, those grapes of the land. So, 
course, we know the story of the spies and uh, how that they were rebellious. So we should take this passage and also record it back in uh, our passage and put in this margin here as well the same little springboard, go back to the study of Hebron, which is back in um, Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18. You might also put the definition of Hebron in here, just so as you're reading through, um, you realize that its name means fellowship, and this is a place of grapes. So you think of wine, and you think of fellowship, and those two things go hand in hand. And if you put the little definition right in the margin here, it's just helpful when we're doing the readings and we come to numbers, we find that this is Hebron, it's a place of fellowship, and what do we find here? We find wine. So that's a helpful thing for us. So moving on from here then, we come next to Joshua. That's the next place where this, this city gets a mention. So come over to Joshua chapter 10, and we're just building our catalog of passages and getting a broad spectrum of what this place is all about. It's kind of like archaeology, but it's a biblical version of it. We're digging through the Bible to find all the different evidences that are given to us of this place. So Joshua chapter 10, and at verse 3, is 40 years on from when the spies were in the land. It's the time when it's now ruled over by a man named Hoham. So Joshua chapter 10 and verse 3, it's wherefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to this man Hoham, who is king of Hebron, unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, and unto Japhia, king of Lachish, and unto Debir, the king of Eglon, and all the others. And he tells them, look, come up with me and help me that we may smite Gibeon. So this is where the Gibeonites um, had gone to Israel, and they'd made a league with them, uh, with Joshua, and now the um, Adonai Zedek is arranging his army to come against them, as we looked at in our previous class. So here we have again a mention of it, and this is the place of Hoham. And of course, Hoham, Strong's number is uh, 1994, and it means whom Yah impels. So just by way of interest, but that again is one of the cities then that would be in rebellion. And of course, remember what we just read in, in Joshua 10, is that the children who lived here, the men who lived here, were the children of Anak. So, it's no surprise, down the road, when Caleb comes along to receive his inheritance, there's giants in the land. But again, Genesis chapter 10, not a bad thing to write in here the meaning of the word Hebron, and springboard it back to uh, Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18. So coming on then, over the page, to Genesis chapter 11, we find here the time of Caleb, and this is of course when he comes to finally take his inheritance. Remember there had been giants in the land, and that's why the people were afraid and didn't want to go up against it, and now he finally gets to take that piece of land. So Joshua chapter 11, in at verse 21 and 22, we find here that there is uh, a war, verse 18, Joshua made long war with all those kings, the ones that have been mentioned previously, and in verse 21, at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains from, where? Hebron, Debir, Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly and their city. So here we have again that reference that Hebron was one of the cities of the giants, one of the cities of the Anakims. So again, it makes perfect sense. This is the place where they had come, where the faithless had said, well, there's nothing we can do, we can't take this place. But of course, um, Joshua and Caleb came in faith. So again, right in Joshua chapter 11, 21 to 22, the meaning of the word Hebron, and, of course, reference it back, springboard it back into our passage in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18, where we're going to write in there just a little note that this was uh, Joshua chapter 11, verses 20 to 21, a home of the sons of Anak, and Joshua destroyed them. So chapter 14 is where Caleb actually finally gets to receive this inheritance. They've gone up to fight against the city, and in verse 13 we read, Joshua blessed Caleb, that is, and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite unto this day, because that he wholly followed Yahweh God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was 
Kirjath Arba, which of course we looked at in the Hebrew being Kiryat Arba, which is Arba, which, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. So this is what Caleb wanted. He wanted the inheritance of, of Hebron for a couple of reasons. Number one was that it was the home of the Anakims, and he wanted to prove that God could deal with the Anakims. And number two was that it was also the place where Abraham was buried. So it was a place very close to Caleb's heart. So again, we want to record in that chapter and springboard it back to um, Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18 to make those connections. And we don't necessarily need to connect all the other ones because Genesis 13, 18 becomes the record that we're going to go to and, and tie everything together with. It's our, our springboard passage. So moving on, then there's one more passage in relationship to um, Caleb, and that's over in chapter 15, just over the page really. And uh, again, we find Joshua chapter 15 and verse 13. We read there, Unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part amongst the children of Judah, according to the commandment of, of the Yahweh to Joshua, even the city of Arba, uh, the father of Anak, which is Hebron. And again, this adds another component to it. We find out that Arba was a great man, as we've read elsewhere. He was one of the, the great Anakims, but he's actually the father of Anak. So he is the progenitor of this whole tribe of the Anakims, of these, these great giants of the land. And of course, this is what is given to Caleb. And the other thing we pick up here is it's part of the tribe of Judah. So when we go back into our Genesis 13 and verse 18 passage, and we cross-reference this, we want to make the note that um, Hebron was in the allotment of the tribe of Judah. Now, it's a little bit more than that. One of the passage in Joshua um, that is very helpful, especially when we come through to the New Testament, although it doesn't pick it up necessarily where we are right now, or we wouldn't pick it up. But in Joshua chapter 21, we find here that this is the allotment to the Levites, right? So Joshua chapter 21, and in verse 9, we write, find that they gave out of the tribe of the children of Judah out of the tribe of the children of Simeon, several of the cities that are mentioned by name. And he goes on to say, which, verse 10, the children of Aaron, being of the family of the Kohathites, who were of the children of Levi, had, for theirs was the first lot. And they gave them the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah, with the suburbs thereof round about. But the fields of the city and the villages thereof gave he to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for a possession. So again, a critical point here, and this comes up later on, is that this is the hill country of Judah. This city and its suburbs round about are given to the tribe of Aaron. Right? Critical point, as we'll pick up later on. Not only that, but it goes on to say in verse 13, Thus they gave to the children of Aaron the priest Hebron with her suburbs to be a city of refuge for the slayer. So it's one of the cities of refuge as well that's laid out there. So again, we want to write down the meaning of Hebron here. It's the city of fellowship. And again, it's the fellowship now of the high priest and of, of Caleb. And it's in the tribe of Judah. And it's a city of refuge. So that's a point to make back in our springboard passage in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18, that this was one of the cities of refuge. So a very interesting point that we're going to come to in just a few moments. So as we go on from here, just one other passage when it comes to Aaron, a um, little bit out of sequence, but just uh, for, for times, well, not time's sake, but just for sort of getting a little bit of background. Let's come to 1st of Chronicles chapter 6, because um, again, this is a mention of the allotment of the tribes um, for Aaron. And 1st Chronicles chapter 6, way at the end of the chapter, it's the great long genealogy of, of um, the sons of Koath and so on and so forth. But we come down to 1st er, Chronicles chapter 6, verse 49, Aaron and his sons were offering, and um, it breaks down who the sons of Aaron are. And then you come all the way down to verse 54. 
These are their dwelling places throughout their castles and their coasts of the sons of Aaron, of the families of the Kohathites, for theirs was the lot. And what do they get? The fields of the city, uh, sorry, uh, verse 55, they gave them Hebron in the land of Judah and the suburbs thereof round about, but the fields of the city and the villages thereof they gave to Caleb the son of Jephunneh. And the sons of Aaron they gave the cities of Judah, namely Hebron, the city of refuge, and Libna, and so on and so forth. So again, it reiterates the fact that this is the city of Aaron, the high priest, and the suburbs are given to him. The rest is given to Caleb, the fields round right about it. And this is a city of refuge. So we can cross-reference those two together and send this back to our, our springboard passage. So again, it's just corroborating the evidence and gathering a little bit more information for us. Now, before we're done with Caleb totally, we, we told that this was his possession, but in Judges chapter 1, as we get the, the transition from Joshua into Judges, um, we have there in the 20th verse, uh, just another little statement that's made. Um, in verse 19, Yahweh was with Judah, and they drave out the inhabitants of the mountain, but they couldn't drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and they expelled thence the three sons of Anak. Um, but the children of Benjamin couldn't drive out the Jebusites from Jerusalem, and so Jerusalem would be taken later on, which is another study altogether. But the point here is that Caleb was able to drive out the three sons of Anak. And so the city of, of, of Hebron um, is a city that is one that is going to be completely given into the tribe of Aaron um, in the allotment of Judah, and it becomes a, a holy uh, city of refuge. So, interesting story, but it also comes up one more time in the Judges, and that is in chapter 16. So if we just turn over to Judges chapter 16, and this is the time, of course, of Samuel, or sorry, Samson. So, Judges chapter 16, Samson goes down to Gaza, which is one of the cities of the Philistines. Now, a little bit of background, Samson belongs to the southern tribe of the Danites. There was the northern Danites that went up and lived in what was called Tel Dan, Laish, as we looked in one of our other studies. And the southern Danites stayed in their original inheritance, and Samson was one of those Danites who lived in that original inheritance. And, of course, he comes down in chapter 16, verse 1, Samson came down to Gaza, and went there and harlot, and he went in unto her, and it was told the Gazite, saying, Samson's come down hither. And of course we know the story. And in verse 3, Samson lay till midnight, and then he arose at midnight, and he took the doors of the gate of the city, and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders, and he carried them up to the top of the hill that is before Hebron. Interesting. Because you think, well, why would Samson carry them to this hill of Hebron? Well, of course, we know that Hebron means to be joined. And again, we want to write that meaning in the margin here. It's where the patriarchs are buried. It's where the promises were reiterated, really. And it's where Caleb had defeated the Philistines and the sons of Anak. But just while we're looking at this, one of the prophecies in relation to um, Abraham is in Genesis chapter 23 and verse 17. So why Hebron? Why would he use this place? Um, well, for all the reasons we've looked at so far, the priests are supposed to be there. Um, but if you come back to Genesis chapter 23, and we look at the promise that's given to Abraham, we read there what was to take place. If I can just get there, Genesis, all the way back into chapter 23. And, of course, this is Abraham, um, time of Abraham. God is appearing to him, and he is blessing him. And this is in Mount Moriah, or Mount Moriah, sorry. And um, the angel, it says, appeared to Abraham the second time. And he says, by myself, verse 16, have I sworn, saith Yahweh, 
For because thou hast done this thing, thou hast not held thine only son, or withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So, of course, it's here that Abraham is promised um, that he's going to possess the gates of his enemies. Um, well, that's the promise that's made, and that's why Samson, in Judges chapter 16 and at verse 3, brings the gates to this place according to the promise. So, when we look at that, it, it makes perfect sense. So again, we want to cross-reference Judges chapter 16, probably want to put in there Genesis 23, 17, the gates of the enemies, make that connection, and then put that back in our springboard passage uh, that we're looking at in Genesis chapter 13 and at verse 18. So we have there again um, the passage written out for us in a little brief descriptor, just a, a, a word or two or a little phrase um, where Samson carried the gates from Gaza to Hebron, possessing the gates of the enemies, and maybe put the compare um, Genesis twenty three seventeen after that as well in our note back in in Genesis uh, thirteen and verse eighteen. So in that catalog, that sort of dossier of of what's going on in Hebron, we build the case of what this place is all about. So now we come in our study to the time of David. He also had something to do with this place, Hebron, which of course. Um, figures heavily into his story. Before he's crowned king there, um, David's on the run. It's during the time period or the lifetime of Saul. Uh, he's a fugitive. And in 1st of Samuel, chapter 30, we find him here, and he's on the run for his life. And he comes in 1st of Kings, cha or 1st Samuel, chapter 30, and verse 30 and 31, it talks about, um, or in verse 26, David came to Ziklag, he sent the spoil to the elders of Judah, and, of course, then it says that um, in verse 30, to them which were in Hormath, and to them which were in Korashan, and to them which were in Akath, and to them which were in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were wont to haunt. So this was a place where David would hang out. And that's worth taking a look at. So we should look up this word and see what it means and write in here those words in the margin. So again, we want to springboard this passage all the way back to Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18. This was a place where David would like to hang out. So we then move on in the story. Of course, David, Saul dies. David becomes king. And we come to 2 Samuel chapter 2. And the first little part of this is, of course, David being made king. And where is this place that he's going to be made king? Makes perfect sense that it's in Hebron. So in 2 Samuel chapter 2, in verse 1 to 4, it came to pass after this that David inquired of Yahweh, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And Yahweh said to him, Go up. And David said, Well, where should I go? Whither should I go up? And he said, To Hebron. So God tells David, this is the place where you have to go. And so David went up thither, his two wives also, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, Abigail, Nabal's wife, um, the Carmelite, and his men that were with him, David bring up every man with him, his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and they anointed David king over the house of Judah, and they told David, saying that the men of Jabesh Gilead, um, they had buried Saul. And so the story goes on. But here is the place where God tells David to go. And here is the place where he is first anointed over the house of Judah. Which, of course, makes perfect sense. Because Hebron was when the allotment of Judah, Caleb was given the suburbs, or the outside, the fields of the city. And Aaron was given the city itself. So this is the city of the high priest. And this is where the king goes to be crowned or to be anointed in the city of the high priest. So a very specific and fitting um, place for David to be. And of course he's there for a period of time. And we read down in verse 11. And the time that David was king over Hebron, 
um, over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. So he is seven years of his initial kingdom or his reign as king is in the city of Hebron. So it's a royal city of Judah, the place where David is first made king. So it's a pretty critical place. Um, just over the page in chapter 3, what we find here is that David's firstborn son is born in Hebron, as are actually six others. Genesis, or 2 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. There was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. So this battle is still going on after Saul's death. And unto David were sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, the second Chileb of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, the third Absalom, the son of Maacha, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, which of course we looked at is that area of Chorazon and Bethsaida, and um, the fourth Adonijah, the son of Haggith, the fifth Shephatiah, the son of Abital, and the sixth Itrium. Uh, by Egla, David's wife, these were born to David in Hebron. So this is where he begins, his family is in the city of Hebron. So six children are born in the city, and he's there for a period about seven years. So it's the beginning of, of the family of David. Um, actually, seven children uh, are born in this place, Amnon and six others. It's also interesting that if you just come over to chapter 4 and verse 12, when Ishbosheth dies and um, he is, is uh, beheaded, in verse 12, David commanded the young men, they slew them, and cut off their hands and their feet, and hanged them up in the pool in Hebron. And they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulchre of Abner in Hebron. So Saul's uh, son Ishbosheth. His head is buried in this place as well. So, a lot of things have gone on in this city. It's a place where David was anointed. And um, in chapter 5, and uh, verses 1, it came to pass all the tribes of Israel, uh, or came all the tribes of Israel to David, unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And in time past, when Saul was king over us, Thou was he that led us out against, or brought us in Israel. And Yahweh said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So David is the captain over Israel, and all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron. So here is where the covenant is made. And King David made a league with them in Hebron before Yahweh, and they anointed David king over Israel. So this is now over all Israel, and David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and then he comes to Jerusalem, and he reigns there for the rest of the time, 33 um, years over Israel and Judah um, from Jerusalem. So a city of great significance, um, the city where David was, was crowned or, or anointed to be king, the city of the high priest, all these layers start to build up, and, and they sort of give us a dossier of what this city of Hebron is all about. It's a very important place. It's not just some backwater city. It is one of the key cities, and of course is where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. Now, when we come then to um, First of Chronicles, the, the, the crossover passage to this, chapter 12, and... Um, 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and at verse 38, um, it just kind of gives you a little bit more information here. 1 Chronicles 12, 38, all these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest of Israel uh, were of one heart to make David king. So again, this is where they made David king. Great cross-reference, and again, we should put this back in our, our springboard of passages. It's not just one passage, but it's multiple passages where we find this information out. So, again, uh, chapter 29 of Chronicles, um, just by way of, of information, really, um, completing our notes, um, verses 26 to 27, we find here that um, David and all, or the son of Jesse reigned over all Israel, 
The time that he reigned over Israel was 40 years. Seven years he reigned in Hebron, and the rest of the time, of course, in Jerusalem. And so it records the same information for us there in Second Chronicles. Um, and uh, it gives us there uh, the basis, really, of David's kingdom. So it's no surprise, then, that when Absalom wants to take the kingdom, where does he base his rebellion from? Well, 2 Samuel chapter 15, Absalom uses the city of Hebron as his place. So when we're doing our readings in 2 Samuel chapter 15, we get to the story of, of Absalom. If we have marked him there, and we put that little passage springboarding ourselves back to Genesis chapter 13, and we look at Genesis 13, verse 18, and we've got our sheet of paper in there. It tells us all the things that happened there. It's the city of, of David, where he was anointed king, where Abraham's buried, where the high priest was, and so on and so forth. You realize why Absalom would choose this city as the place where he wanted to have his rebellion start from. So um, it's very key. Uh, so 2 Samuel chapter 15, and verse 7 we find there it came to pass after 40 years, so I think it's after Absalom's 40 years old, that Absalom said to the king, I pray thee, let me go I pray and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto Yahweh in Hebron. So Absalom, of course, is lying through his teeth here. And um, he says, For thy servant vowed a vow while I was abode at Geshur at his grandfather's place in Syria, saying, If Yahweh bring me again indeed into Jerusalem, then I will serve Yahweh. And so the king said unto him, Go in peace. So he arose, and he goes to Hebron. And Absalom sent spies to all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. Of course, he brings his whole conspiracy together. But that's where David had begun his reign. So Absalom just follows exactly in David's footsteps. And of course, David hears about this, and he flees out of the city. And uh, so again... It makes perfect sense why Absalom would choose this place. So let's mark into our Second Samuel chapter five, verses seven to ten, what the meaning of the word Hebron is, and then cross-reference it back to our springboard passage back in Genesis chapter thirteen and verse eighteen. Then, when we're doing the readings, we have all this information in there in Hebron. And the conspiracy here takes on a whole new meaning. It makes sense. It's very strategic. It's not just, you know, he chose Hebron out of the sky. So now we come to the time period of Rehoboam. And in Second Chronicles, chapter 11, and verse 5, we find here that Rehoboam is strengthening himself, and he's trying to fortify what's left of his kingdom. So we find there Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem, and he built cities for defense in Judah, which of course makes sense, because that's where Hebron is. And he built even Bethlehem, Etam, Tekoa, Bethzer, Shoko, Adullam, Gath, Marsha, Ziph, Adorim. Um, and then he goes on Lachish, Ezekah, Zorah, Ajalon, and Hebron, which is in Judah, and in Benjamin fenced cities. And he fortified the strongholds and so on and so forth. So here we have Rehoboam who takes this royal city, Hebron, the city where his grandfather um, was, um, was anointed. And he takes that city and he makes it a fortified city. So it's part of the defense cities of the area of Judah. Now that's the last mention of Hebron in the Old Testament. Now after this, of course, we have... Um, a long period of time where there is no uh, mention of Hebron. Um, it doesn't come up in any of the other the, uh, the passages that, between the Testaments. But where we find it next is in the time period of Herod the Great. Herod the Great, of course, we're going to have a, a whole other class on him in that period between the Testaments. But Herod, to shore himself up and to win favor with the Jews, he, of course, was an Idumean, um, basically from the, uh, the tribe of, or from the people of Esau. Um, he was an Idumean. He married into the, the Maccabee family uh, to try and sort of bolster his own personal standing. And what he did to please the Jews was he built certain sites. Of course, we're very familiar with the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, we're very familiar with Masada. There's Herodium, the Caesarea Philippi. Um, there is uh, Caesarea Maritima, where the Apostle Paul was captured and, and locked up for a period of time. But one of the other places that he built was the 
cave or the, the tomb of the patriarchs, which is still standing in Hebron today. It's the last real standing structure built by Herod. Masada is still there, but of course it's largely ruins. The platform is there, the Temple Mount, the Western Wall, which is just simply the, the face of the platform. But this, the actual tomb of the patriarchs is still standing today in Jerusalem, and, or in Hebron, and this was built by Herod the Great. Now it's since been taken over by the Crusaders and by, of course, Islam and, and the Muslims and so on and so forth. And the Jews have, have reclaimed it in the last little while. But that city and that place specifically goes all the way back to the time of Herod the Great. Now what's really interesting about that, of course, is that Herod died around the year 4 BC um, or thereabouts just around the time of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, of course, that he was the one that gave the decree to have all the children killed in Bethlehem. So if we come to that time period and the people that were involved around that time, we find something very fascinating. And that is in the beginning of the, the story of the Lord Jesus Christ and of John the Baptist. It comes up in the Gospel of Luke. So, so come in your Bible to Luke chapter 1, where we have the background to the Lord Jesus Christ's birth. And of course the story begins with the family of Aaron, um, or of Elizabeth and, um, and of Zacharias, who are from Aaron's uh, lineage. So we come there in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the one who built the great tomb of the patriarchs in, in, uh, in Her Hebron, so there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they both were righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And of course, they don't have a, a child. And Zacharias, as we read, is, is to go to the temple in verse 8, it came to pass that while he was executing the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And he goes into the temple, and of course we know the story is that he sees the angel, and the angel makes this promise to him. So we read here, he is of the course of Abiah. Well, what does that mean to us? We'll come back, if you would, to First of Chronicles, because this is where the genealogy, sometimes, you know, we read through the genealogies and we groan through them, and uh, if you have a grandmother like mine, she's critical on how you read all of those names, and uh, sometimes it can be a little daunting, but there's a little key piece of information here that's very, very helpful. So, First of Chronicles, chapter 24 and verse 1. Now, these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron, the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. So this is the division of the sons. They are the sons of um, Aaron. So we come down then, as it lists off all the sons, uh, we have them broken out for us. But we come down to verse 6, we have Shemaiah, the son of Nathaniel, the scribe, one of the Levites, wrote before them, the, or before the king and the princes, and Zadok the priest, and Ahimelech the son of Abiathar, and before the chief of the, the fathers of the priests, the Levites, one principal household being taken from Eleazar, one taken from Ithamar, and the first lot came forth to Jehoriab, the second to Jediah, the third to Harim, the fourth to Seorim, the fifth to Malkijah, or Malkijah, the sixth to Majamim, or Majamin, I guess it is, and um, the seventh to Hakaz, the eighth to Abijah. Now, Abijah is the same Abiah that we read of in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 6. This is the divisions of the sons of Aaron, and this Abiah is the same. So this is one of the, the sons of Aaron that, um, Ithar, that uh, Zacharias is a part of. Well, what are they supposed to be doing? Verse 29, if, or sorry, verse 19 as you read down, 
These were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of Yahweh according to their manner under Aaron their father as Yahweh God of Israel had commanded him. So these different priests were to come in according to their courses. Back over to Luke, we find there that Zacharias was of the course of Abiah. So this is one of the sons of Aaron, right? Or, or of the family of Aaron. And if you come over to chapter, chapter, um, Luke chapter 1, um, we're told here that her cousin um, was Elizabeth. Which is interesting. Now we're told here that uh, verse 5, the wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name is Elizabeth. Okay, But when we come over to verse 35 and 36, we find here that Mary has a cousin, and her cousin is this Elizabeth. So we think, well, how does that work? So just read the verse together. Luke chapter 1, verse 36, Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also hath conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month wherein she who was called barren. For with God nothing is impossible. So here we have a very interesting piece of information that Mary was also a daughter of Aaron. Well, you think, well, how exactly is that possible? And the reason is, is because... Mary, uh, her grandmother, um, must have been of the tribe of Aaron. So let's go over to Luke chapter 3 and verse 23. Here we read that Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, as was supposed the son of Joseph, which we read is the son of Heli, or Eli, uh, who is believed to be Mary's uh, grandmother. Now, the interesting thing here is, is that when you put these two together, Mary's father was obviously of the tribe of Judah, because she's in the line of Judah. But her mother must have been in the tribe of Aaron, in order for her cousin Elizabeth, who was of the children of Aaron, um, to be her cousin. So, what's fascinating about that is in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a lineage where he comes from both the line of Judah and the line of Aaron. Through the father, he is from the tribe of Judah. Um, that is through Mary's father. And through Mary's mother, we have a connection with the tribe of Aaron, because Elizabeth, of course, is her cousin. So it's a mix of a king and a priest. And, of course, that makes perfect sense to us when we come to the book of Hebrews. So come over, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 7, because this was one of the titles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it comes out of the Psalms, as we'll see in just a moment. But Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 1, we read about Melchizedek, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, the priest of the Most High God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And so we find out here that there's this Melchizedek character, who in verse 2, it says, To whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that king of Salem, which is king of peace. And it tells us he's without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. And he goes on to talk about this, this Melchizedek. But here's the interesting thing, that that Melchizedek priesthood is the line in which the Lord Jesus Christ comes. He is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Come back to Psalm 110. So Psalm 110, and we want to connect all these together in our Bible marking as we go through and write them down in our passage, our springboard passage, because this is where it all ties together. But the 110th Psalm paints the picture for us, or, or really completes the tapestry. Psalm 110, and we read there in verse 4, Yahweh hath sworn, and will not repent, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Well, who was Melchizedek? He was both king and priest. Who is the Lord Jesus Christ? He is both king and he is also priest. 
His mother Mary had lineage both from the kings, from Judah, and also from Aaron, being of course connected to um, Elizabeth as her cousin. Now this makes perfect sense because the picture that's painted for us in Isaiah is of the Lord Jesus Christ. So come to Isaiah chapter 6, and we find here a vision that Isaiah sees. He sees a vision, and we read there in Isaiah chapter 6, in verse 1, it's the year that King Uzziah died. Well, Uzziah had been the king who had wanted to go into the, into the temple and offer incense. And he was told by the high priest, this does not pertain unto you. You're from the tribe of Judah. This is for the sons of Aaron. And so he had leprosy and, and lived separately until the time of his death. So this is the time that he dies. It says, the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also Adonai um, sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So we have a throne in the temple. And above it stood one of the seraphim, each of one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he did covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So that's a, a separate study, the study of the seraphim. But notice what he says, one cried to another, and the seraphim sing out, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts, or Yahweh of armies, the whole earth is full of his glory. So this is a, a picture of the kingdom age, when Messiah has come, when the kingdom is established, the Jews are back in the land, and the whole earth is full of the glory of God. And what does he say when he sees all this going on? He says in verse 5, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, or Yahweh of hosts. So this is one of the titles that then is given to Christ, who is the King, but he's also priest of the Most High God. And so that is the title that's given to him there. He is both king and he is priest, tied right into the lineage of Mary and, of course, the connection to Elizabeth. So try to picture this in terms of what it would have meant back in the days of Elizabeth and Mary. Um, Mary is the cousin of um, Elizabeth. That's where her family, her mother's family, anywhere you're from. And so she goes to visit Elizabeth. Well, where does Elizabeth live? Well, we read there in, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 39, Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. So Elizabeth lives in a city of Judah but it's not just any city of Judah, it's in the hill country of Judah. That's the description that's given of Hebron. It's the only city that's described as being as the hill, in the hill country of Judah. And so it was also Elizabeth who was of the tribe of Levi, of the family of Aaron, who, if you remember, were given Hebron as their inheritance and its suburbs. So this would have been where... Elizabeth would have lived. This is where Mary, uh, her mother anyway, was from, where Mary's mother would have grown up. No doubt she would have visited there as a child. So when Elizabeth, or when Mary went to visit Elizabeth there, she would have seen the tomb of the patriarchs that was built by Herod the Great and was completed by him still standing today. She would have walked by and she would have seen that when she went to visit um, Elizabeth in this place. It also means that John the Baptist, growing up in this place, would have seen that same building every day. So when we go to Hebron and we see the tomb of the patriarchs built by Herod the Great, this very place would have had great significance and would have been in the tapestry of the mind of both John the Baptist, of Mary, of Elizabeth, and Zechariah. They would have all seen it. So it puts us in touch right into this, this first century period with the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, just one last thing on this. And that is this idea of the king priest that we see in Mary's line. It's what we're invited into. Come to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Because here we have in chapter 1 and verse 6, um, John is writing, it's the message from the Lord Jesus Christ, um, it says in verse 5, From Jesus Christ was the faithful witness, the first begotten from the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, which is us, the kings of the earth, it will be, 
unto him that loved us and washed us in our, and from our sins in his own blood, the king priest, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, and to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Not after the line of Aaron, but after the line of Melchizedek. We are made kings and priests. And that's what, remember that's what they sang out, the seraphim? Well, the seraphim appear again, uh, similar to the cherubim in, in Revelation chapter 5 and uh, 4 and 5. They're singing the same song in chapter 4 and verse 8. The four living creatures, they've got the six, six wings just like they did back in, in Isaiah. They're full of eyes and they rest not day and night and they sing the same song. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And these same kings, then, we read in verse 10, or the redeemed, they sing this song in verse 9, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And verse 10, hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we will reign upon the earth. So that ties us in with this whole king priesthood the city of Hebron, and who chose Hebron? But the Gentile Caleb, the one who was joined to the tribe of Judah. He chose that to the place that he wanted for an inheritance, because that's where Abraham was. He chose it because that's where the giants were defeated, and that's where our Lord Jesus Christ would have known about when he was a little boy growing up, where John the Baptist would have grown up, herald his, his, his first coming and where of course it has great significance to us.